I love the variety of speakers that we have at Life Church, and I love to see people growing in their gifting as well. And uh, I've really enjoyed listening to Abigail Gallagher preaching before, so I know we're in for a treat this morning. Um, and so I'm going to hand over to Abigail, but I'd love you to give her a really, really warm welcome. Abigail. Thank you. <laughs> That's very kind of you. Thank you, Chris. Um, Why don't I just pray for us before we get stuck into God's word together? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much that we can come before you, that we have your word to get to know you better and to understand who we are in the light of your word. Lord, we thank you for your spirit with us. And so we pray, Lord God, that you would be with us now as we look at your word and you would speak to us, that we would be expectant and listening to what you have to say to us. Please, Lord God. Amen. Amen. So we've been treated to some real um, treasures, haven't we, so far in 1 Peter. Um, Pretty awesome chapter. We're still only in the first chapter. And we've been thinking about our new birth that we have. We've been thinking about this inheritance that will never perish or fade, all in Jesus. The truths that even angels have longed to look into. The truth that says that we can have hope even in suffering, that it will be making us more like Jesus. So if you have your Bibles open um, uh, or on your screens, uh, it's not going to come up. So uh, read along with me if you can. There's a couple of spare Bibles down here if you want one as well. But we're going to carry on um, with Peter, looking at verses 13 to 19. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So Peter is now turning his attention to the elect chosen exiles and urging them on in holiness. Did you see that in verse 15 um, to 16? But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. That is cool. Wait, a meaty verse. I think maybe at first glance, that's frankly quite a petrifying verse. Be holy as I am holy. I wonder if it scares us because it sounds a little bit like like this, okay? It's a bit like someone coming along and say to you, okay, um, I need you to run as fast and as long and as excellently as Mo Farah. Do we remember Mo Farah? I think we've got, there we go, there he is. Okay, he, if you don't know who he is, he's he's one of our greatest ever long distance runners. If you said that to me, I'm going to let you into a secret. I've got to do quite a lot of prep, okay? I'm going to need to start at the very beginning. I've got to do couch to 5K. Running is not not my thing. Um, And actually, I'm probably starting a little bit too late to train. So even if I tried really hard, can you imagine a race with me and Mo Farah, okay? It's not going to take long at all before the distance is blindingly obvious to everyone. But some of you are thinking, well, do you know what? I'm quite good at running, actually. Yeah, I've done part run already this weekend. Oh, this sounds like a fun challenge. I could try and do this. Maybe you're like, I've run a marathon. I don't know, you know I'm running a marathon? No, okay, well, maybe you do need some more training in that case. Um, and so you might think you have a chance at doing this. And as we're watching the race unfold, maybe we could start to think, oh, yeah, maybe they can do this. But you know what? I've got to be honest. I think it wouldn't actually take too long before we saw the gap between you and Mo. Because actually neither of us can run as fast or as long and as well as Mo Farah. We're not Olympians. We just can't. Is that what God is saying to us here? 
Is he giving us an impossible task, a weighty burden? Be holy as I am holy. And that's actually even more impossible than being like Mo Farah, isn't it? Because Mo Farah will age, um, he could trip, have an accident, have a bad day. But our God doesn't have bad days. He is holy. So what then does it mean to be holy? I think it understand, it, sorry, I think it starts with our understanding of who God is. If we're called to be like Mo Farah, we've got to know who Mo Farah is. So in the same way, we've got to understand what the task is by understanding who God is. Now, it's quite interesting because holiness is the only characteristic of God that gets that triple repetition in the Bible. Um, it's not love, 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 or God is mercy, 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 or God is justice, justice, justice. No, actually, holy, 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 complete holiness. Uh, we see in Isaiah 6 and Revelation uh, 4, each time it's heavenly creatures declaring that God is holy, holy, holy. The heavenly creatures giving us a glimpse into the heart of heaven. So we have um, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The earth is full of his glory. Or in Revelation 4, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Truly holy is the equivalent of his godness. He is holiness himself, itself. I am holy. Now, the main meaning of the word holy is actually separate. It comes from the word to cut or to separate. So that's why we have phrases like a cut above, a cut apart, like superiorly excellent. God is higher than the world and he has absolute power over it. There's nothing that has power over him. There's no, no one like him. He is so holy that the Bible says his very name itself is holy. Holy is your name. And I hadn't thought about it before, but actually that's the first thing that Jesus teaches us to pray, isn't it? Hallowed be your name. Holy be your name. We're told we mustn't misuse his name. To misuse it is to actually break the law in itself. And when God comes to speak to Moses in the sight of the Israelites, there are limits put around the mountain because it is set apart as holy. God is there. There's smoke and fire. Even to be in the camp around it, you've got to be consecrated. And throughout the Bible, we see the consequence for those who don't honour him, who don't consider him holy and disregard his word. The consequence is death. And actually, as we go on as Christians, we should grow in our understanding there you go, nice array, uh, of how holy God is, how pure he is, how other he is, how, how much he is not like us. And his holiness is serious stuff. And it should blow our minds. And as he is so holy, we must pay attention to what he says, what his, our holy God says to us, what he commands us to do. And that is the astonishing thing. He commands us to be like him, to be holy. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. We're called to be holy, to complete holiness. Now, this isn't something new that Peter is writing about. Peter is quoting from ver- in verse 16 from Leviticus, God's call to his people to be set apart, to be holy, to be distinguished. It's always been there. The American theologian R.C. Sproul points out that it goes back actually to the very beginning. He says, this call to holiness was first given to Adam and Eve. This was the original assignment of the human race. We were created in the image of God. To be God's image meant, among other things, that we were made to mirror and reflect God's character. We were created to shine forth to the world the holiness of God. This was the chief end of man, the very reason for our existence. Being holy is being like God. 
to be like Jesus. And when I was a teen, there were the WWJD bracelets. I don't know if any of you had them or if they're still a big thing around. Um, but there they are, all different colors you could have on your arm. Um, and they basically stand for what would Jesus do? So the idea is in whatever you're doing, as you catch a glimpse of those letters, you stop and think, what would Jesus do? And you do like him. That's the kind of thing, isn't it? But confession time here, I often think I've got a really warped view of holiness, to be honest with you. Um, even growing up in the church, phrases like holier than thou, or oh, such a holy Joe, or kind of oh, holier than thou, bit of eye rolling, you're so holy. Being, being called holy was actually often used as a bit of an insult. Um, and maybe seen as a bit pious and boring. We've kind of done the word a real disservice. It was, wasn't something that I perceived as good, or even more, the very reason for my existence. And as I'm going on in my journey as a Christian, I'm starting to grasp that holiness is what God wants for us. And therefore, it's something I should want for me to. To be holy is, is epic. It's to be like Jesus, to shine for him. And I know that Jesus is anything but pious and boring, right? And this call to be holy is in all we do, not just for one area of life, but in all you do, in your work life, in your home life, in your sex life, with your friends, your family, your money, your goals, your ambition. No, and it's not just even about the things that other people see. God sees our hearts. He sees our thoughts. And he calls me to be holy in all I do, there isn't one area of life, not one action, not one thought that we aren't called to be holy in. All our life. If we call Jesus Lord, he must be Lord of everything. But this may now be causing a problem for you. Um, how? How can I possibly be holy? I can't get out the starting block in this race. Mo Farah's already shot past, right? The distance is huge. You, you don't need to spend that much time with me to know that I am not holy in all I do. And actually, you guys don't even see what goes in on my head and my heart. Should I just give up now? And actually, as I go on um, understanding holiness and the call to it, the more I realize just how far short I see, I kind of fall from that. It's like, on that chart, as we grow to understanding God's holiness and call to holiness, the more we see that gap of our sin, the more we see how deep our sin is, how far short we have fallen from what it is that God is calling us to. Well, don't despair. Let's see what help Peter gives us as we grapple with what it means for us to be holy. We are holy because he has made us so. This call to holiness doesn't come from nowhere, does it? It comes from a direct response to all the treasure we've already had unpacked in 1 Peter. God has been merciful to us. He has made us new. We've been born again, verse 3, into a living hope from the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, that is kept in heaven for you. Therefore, in verse 13, Therefore, set your hope fully on grace. It is only because of what God has done that we can be holy. This is not our doing. There isn't a chance of making ourselves holy enough to be acceptable to God. I have more chance of winning gold in a marathon than that. Holiness isn't attainable. But guess what? It has been attained for you. Look at the exiles Peter's writing to. Before knowing God, they've been living, in verse 14 we see, they've been following passions of ignorance. They're unaware of the better treasures on offer, unaware of where their life was leading them. In verse 18, they're, they're living in the inheritance of futile ways. It's pointless, meaningless. They're following just what's happening around them with no possibility of it leading to hope and life and holiness. But now, as elect exiles, they have new life in Jesus. Because of his mercy, they can set their hope on his grace. Their hope and our hope is being set on it all being done. Their old ways and our old ways 
the price of our rebellion against God, our lack of holiness, have a real cost. It is death. But that price has been paid. And in verse 19, can you see they have been ransomed? And it has been paid by something so trustworthy, so wonderful, so costly and real, so much better than anything this world could offer to ransom, much better than perishable gold or silver. It has been paid by the precious blood of Christ, our perfect sacrifice. If we trust in Jesus' blood, then we can have full and complete confidence of this. We are forgiven. That God looks at us and sees Jesus' blood and his righteousness. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Holiness isn't attainable, but it is attained for you. And here's the secret. Here's the joy, right? God is never surprised by our sin. He understands the depth of it far more than we do. He has fully paid the ransom for every area of our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. He has always known it and taken the price for it. I don't know if we can go to the slide which has the holiness and the sin and the cross in it. Um, thank you. This is the thing, right? Every area, he has taken the price for it. We're fully forgiven, so we can run at holiness. We can long to go for it and live for him. We're free to live like Jesus. And Jesus, um, and just think about, sorry, how the letters are written in the New Testament, written to ordinary believers, addressed to the saints, which literally means holy people. They were set apart and called to purity. But then in the letter, these same saints are rebuked for their foolish behavior and their sinful behavior. They're battling with sin, but they're not disqualified because they battle. Actually, do you see it shows they're qualified? They are battling. They can battle. They don't need to live in their old ways. Instead, they can grow in becoming like Jesus and live out the life that Jesus has given them. So the only problem is when our view of the cross doesn't grow with us to match that gap. As we understand, there you go. See, if we understand God's holiness and then feel wretched about our sin, but we haven't made the gap, we haven't made Jesus' blood big enough and growing with that, then we're left in despair. But as our view of the, of the holiness of God and just how far we fall and short grows, so should our amazement at what Jesus has done on the cross. So should we marvel more and more as we think of what he has done, as what his precious blood has achieved for us. And as we go on as Christians, that is the, the process of sanctification, be more like Jesus. God is going to keep showing us ways that we fall short, ways that we are not like him. And that's not because he's mean and he wants us to feel horrible. He wants us to feel bad and like failures and hypocrites. But it's because he's good and he wants to free us from them and make us more like him. He wants us to grasp more fully the life that he's offering us, the life that he's given to us, the life in Jesus to see what we've been ransomed from, to understand more deeply the kind of the cost of that inheritance of futility and the preciousness of the undefiled inheritance that is kept in heaven for us. To set our hope fully on grace means we're free to hunger to be more like Jesus until the day that Jesus is revealed and we see him face to face, we can keep on growing in becoming more like him, in reflecting him. We don't need to be surprised when we sin. We don't need to consider ourselves as failures. Instead, we can know that deep knowledge of being fully forgiven. The cross has done it all. It has dealt with it. We are free to pursue holiness. And we can know that our standing before him isn't going to change. It is not based on our behavior. It is based on what Jesus has done. So setting our hope fully on grace means we can come quickly to God to say we're sorry when we see our sin, to ask his forgiveness, knowing we will be forgiven, that we are forgiven, that he offers us treasures and they are ours now that he is the father who's longing, who's waiting for us to turn back to him, 
and he runs towards us. He runs with his freedom. Uh, it's that really powerful verse that comes to mind in Christ alone. So when we feel like failures, when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upwards I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless saviour died, my sinful soul is counted free. And God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. We're free. And so in verse 14, Peter's call to the elect exiles is to say now as obedient children, children of God, live this out. Your life should be different now. You have this hope, this God. Remember, it is as his children we are called to obedience. Our father is not a mean taskmaster master, asking us the impossible. But actually, he's a loving father who wants the best for his children and has given the best for them. He has given them his holiness. And so we start seeking to live holy lives with hearts that are full of thankfulness and love. Uh, last week, we looked a bit at John 14, verse 23, and I'll just read that again. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Our obedience is an act of love. To live out holiness is to listen to precious Jesus' teaching and do it. The call to be holy is a call to go on an adventure together with our Heavenly Father, living out the obedience that Christ has given us, showing we can trust our Father has the right plan, that we want to listen to his voice and live out the way he shows in freedom and goodness. But you might be looking down to verse 17 and wondering quite if I'm missing something here, how does that fit? If you call him, if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear during your time of exile. Fear the Lord. Hang on, after all I've just said about hope and grace, should we actually be cowering in fear? Scared about future judgment? Um, last term, when we were studying Proverbs, in our life group, we had a memory verse. I'm not going to call on anyone here to see if they can remember it, um, but you can ask them afterwards. So it's Proverbs 9, verse 10, uh, and it was, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. There's a healthy and right fear of the Lord. It basically means we understand he is the Lord. It's a bit like seeing that, that graph going up, he is the Holy One. Um, and it means we take him seriously, doesn't it? And it means we take sin and its cost seriously. We see he is the one who can rightly judge sin. Actually, fearing the God shows, shows that we care. It shows we want to honour him um, more than anyone or anything else. Because actually what we fear is going to be what shapes our lives. And if we're not fearing God, we're fearing something else. Maybe we're just fearing what others will think, and that's controlling us. Fear of not having enough money, fear of not missing out. Um, there's a long list of things, but actually none of these things are going to help us or offer us life. None of these things know what's best for us. To know the Holy One is the beginning of understanding. And as we know him, he doesn't want us to fear him from far off, but to come and understand him, to know him, to be in relationship with him. Um, I was struck when reading Exodus chapter 33, how Moses talks to God. In 33 verse 15 to 16, then Moses says to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? What else will distinguish me and your people from all other people on the face of the earth? The only thing that's going to distinguish the Israelites as God's people is his presence. The only thing that will distinguish the elect exiles in Peter's letter from the world around them is God's presence. And the only thing that's going to distinguish us as God's people from the world around us is his presence. And if we've trusted in Jesus' blood, his death and resurrection, 
then we have the Holy Spirit. We have God himself living in us. And guess what? The Holy Spirit knows what holiness is. He knows and he wants to produce holiness in us. He wants to make us more like Jesus. He's going to guide us. He's going to reveal us into us. He's going to point us to Jesus and what Jesus has done. And as he does, so he, the Holy Spirit, will bear the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. He will bear love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. That's what he's about. In her book, Pure, Linda Marshall writes, God has graciously given us his Holy Spirit so that we can have the freedom to serve him and love him and do his will. It is God's will that we should be made holy. For in holiness, true freedom and satisfaction are found. In holiness, true freedom and satisfaction are found. It is not a dull word. It is a good word. So returning to the image of Mo Farah that I, I set us at the beginning, imagine for a minute, instead of, so the call is still the same, right? To run like him. But actually, uh, you've been chosen to become a part of Mo Farah's family, okay? A task you can never complete in yourself, a, a price you can never pay back. You're able to be reborn and you're now reborn as Mo Farah's kids. You have his very genes. You have his blood in your veins. And you are able to run, therefore, as fast and as long as him. But you also, growing up, you also get to grow up with Mo Farah as your dad, teaching and training you to be able to run like him, to run with him, to learn his successful style, to enjoy running together. And he's going to give you all the same training equipment, the same running gear as he has. There's nothing he holds back. And I think this is a closest picture to what God is calling us to in holiness. It's only an illustration, but I think that is the heart of it. To live, uh, not to, to run to earn our salvation, but to run as those who have been saved with him. To enjoy God's holiness and reflect it to live in that power that God has given us, to have a heart that longs to be like Jesus, that hungers for holiness. And so if you want to hunger for holiness, if we want to grasp more of what's on offer, but it's all done, what do we do? We have a choice as we run, don't we? Actually, as most kids, we'd be foolish to try and do it with the old threadbare trainers when he's given us new ones. If there's a, a different destination offered to us, no, no, we should listen to our Father rather than think we can do it ourselves or follow those who've never run before. When we make mistakes, we should go to the only one who could help us. And so Peter's telling the exiles, get your minds in gear, know this truth, this hope, so that you can live it. So to prepare your minds for action, being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Prepare your minds for action. Literally gird your loins for action. So get ready to run. Get your trainers. Get your trainers on your mind in a way. Um, sober-minded. And I think these two things links. Um, so the opposite of sober-minded, I guess, would be to be drunk-minded, right? When that sort of suggests you're not going to be very ready for action if your mind's all befaddled with um, other things. And if you're drunk-minded, I guess you're, you're drinking in the ways of the world around you, aren't you? And when you're drunk, the understanding of your world is distorted. So perhaps you can think you're invincible, or perhaps you just feel you're worthless. Um, you can think things are safe that aren't, and you can hurt others, and you get hurt yourself, unaware of the consequences of your behavior when you're drunk. So actually, no, we are called to be sober-minded, to be aware of the world around us, alert to who God is, what our true identity is, and expectant for Jesus' return. To have prepared and sober minds means we feed our minds truth from God's word. We need to get thinking as Jesus thinks, to value what he values, to despise what he despises. It means we want to be deliberate about what we're filling our minds with, 
what we're listening to, reading, scrolling through. We don't want to be distracted from this good news. We don't want to have our thinking distorted. And we don't need escapism, do we? We don't need to be distracted and drunk. We have hope. So keep coming back to that hope. Keep coming back to that cross slide where just keep coming back to grasp the fullness of what grace is. As Paul puts it in Romans 12, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Go be holy. That's the call. Go be holy. Um, and here is one like, small example of something from a couple of days ago that might show this. Um, I was walking down my street and my thoughts turned to a landlord um, that I once had. And as I thought about this person, I got quite angry and I thought of various words to call her that weren't holy. And, and as I was thinking these things, um, a line from the song, my heart is filled with thankfulness to him who bore my pain, popped into my head, which made me laugh because quite frankly, my heart was not filled with thankfulness, right? It wasn't at all. Um, but because I've been thinking about this talk, I was alert. <laughs> I was alert to what I was thinking about and thought about that, that, just the, yeah, that clash of thinking. I was filling my mind with unkind thoughts. I was letting an old resentment fill my mind. So I chose holiness. I realized I was wrong in my thoughts and I repented of them and I looked to Jesus and I was filled with thankfulness. He bore my pain. And actually that realization of sin, it didn't weigh me down and make me feel like a failure as I walked down the road. It didn't make me think what a horrible person I was. Instead, in confessing it, in being real with Jesus and being sorry and knowing I was forgiven and loved, I walked down the street with a bit of a spring in my step. And the alternative would have been to let my mind fester and my soul clog up with this resentment. And I would have missed out on the joy of being an obedient child, called to holiness, walking along and talking to my father. So it's in the things that are seen and unseen we're called to holiness. Choosing to be holy, letting Jesus be Lord of all our thoughts, choosing to want to be like him. We want to see things the way he does and act in the way he would act. It's good for us. And it is universal across all our lives, isn't it? When we were brought with the precious blood of Jesus, our whole lives were ransomed. We are fully God's. So we need to surrender our whole lives to him. And that means we can dare to ask the Spirit to show us where we aren't being holy, where we can ask for forgiveness with the confidence he will forgive because the penalty has been dealt with at the cross. We can know the freedom of forgiveness all over again and have the power the same power that raised Jesus from the dead in our lives, helping us live out our lives as holy ones. We can look at how Jesus spent time in the word, how he withdrew to spend quality time with his father, how he loved to build others up. And we can help ask him to help us to be like that. It's a radical call. Nothing's off limits. Everything about Jesus is on offer for us. To be holy, to have that heart attitude to say, Lord Jesus, I want to be like you. Help me to be like Jesus. So hopefully we've seen that holiness is good news. God's holiness is something to rejoice in. And his call to us is to be holy like him. Distinct, set apart. Church, we have an awesome mission together to reflect our God to the world around us. And do you know what? We fall short in that mission. And that should bring us to our knees. That should bring us in repentance and sorrow to him. But in turn, that should lead us to praise for knowing that Jesus' blood has covered us and create a desire in our hearts to want to grow in being more like him. Set our hope completely on Jesus to live that out. And I think we need to stop being complacent. I think we need to start really, truly hungering for holiness, for all that God has given us and offers us, to let God have our whole lives and be transformed to live for Jesus. Um, if the worship band wants to start coming back up, well, I pray for us. Shall we pray together? Lord God, we stand in awe of you. Lord, we look at your holiness. Lord God, you are holy, holy, holy. There is no one like you. 
Please, Lord God, would you help us see that anew? Would you give us a new and a deeper understanding of who you are? How incomparable you are. How awesome you are. Lord God, we love you and we thank you. And Lord, we see who we are in the light of you. We see our failings, we see our struggles. And Lord Jesus, you know them. And Lord God, you've rescued us. We thank you for the precious blood of Christ. We thank you that your blood has covered our shame and our sin, that we're forgiven, that we are free, that we know your grace. And Lord God, we long to live for you. We long to live out this call to be like you because you have caught us up into you. We're in Jesus and you've given us your spirit. So Lord, we pray that you would help us to walk with you, to walk with your spirit, to not be afraid of sin, to, re to repent of it and come and know your forgiveness, to not stand down in the depths of our sin, but to cling to the cross. Would our view of the cross and your good news grow and grow, that we would worship you. Lord, as we worship you now in song, but as we worship you in our whole lives, as we carry on this week and keep walking through Peter over these next few weeks as well, Lord, would you keep showing us areas of our lives that we need to bring under your sovereignty? Um, would you help us to know in new ways the freedom from sin that you have given us, that we would walk as your holy ones because of Jesus? In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen.